So now let's get into some training applications. And uh, yeah, I mean, as always, it starts with, with the assessment. I know I sound like a broken record with that, but um, you know, when we talk about the, the fascial stuff and the sling stuff, it's not, you know, uh, you know, how do I fit it in or, or how do I apply it or, or you know, it, it's no different than anything else. I mean, you know, how do you know when you need to program a, an RDL versus something that's quad dominant for somebody? Well, you, you look at their assessment, you look at what they show you. So, um, you know, I'm always thinking when the athlete shows you what they need, give them exactly that. Uh, don't overthink it here. So we're looking at, um, you know, the individual athletes, uh, deficiencies and weaknesses. So anterior, posterior, lateral sling, we can manually test those if they show that they're weak on, you know, just the anterior sling or, you know, something I see commonly is somebody will be strong on the, the left side of the anterior sling, but the, uh, you know, weak on the right anterior sling. Um, you know, so looking at independent bilateral differences as well. Um, then we look at, you know, flexion and, and extension and rotational intolerances, uh, kind of thinking back to those spiral chains. Um, how much, you know, compensatory or aberrant movement patterns are they showing? Uh, this is obviously a big one, you know, when athletes are coming off of injury. And then looking at, you know, proprioceptive motor control coordination. Um, the specific demands of the sport or, the, or of duty. Um, I, I'm a big, big believer in looking at the unique elements and signatures of movement. Uh, it's, it's impossible to program completely, in my opinion, if we just look at, you know, football is a sagittal base sport or a, a baseball is a frontal base sport. I mean, it, it's just not the case. The, the move, movement in sport is extraordinarily unique. So I think we just have to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, but in addition to that, we're looking at rotational and anti-rotational forces in demand. Um, what are the vectors of force most commonly experienced and what are the speeds of the movement? So I mentioned it a second ago. You know, where's the weak link in the chain? Um, my assessment is going to look similar to this where we're going to just kind of get a global tone or a feel if somebody, you know, super bound up, are they super loose and, and almost laxic everywhere? Um, active versus passive ranges of motion. I've, I've talked quite extensively about this, but with active, or I'm sorry, with passive range of motion, we're looking at tissue extensibility, pliability, um, whereas with active range of motion, we're looking more at motor control and stability. Um, Strength and function of the slings. How do they look in locomotive or primitive patterns? And their ability to produce or, or demonstrate reflexive strength. Those are kind of the, the big five um, for assessing, assessing the fascia. What I boil that down to, this is probably my biggest point of interest for the athletes that I work with. Um, too soft versus too stiff. Is this athlete more likely to be injured because they are too stiff to avoid it or too soft to endure it? Um, so this has helped me to kind of just set the themes for, for my programming. Um, but for guys and girls who are, are too stiff, you know, we want to put an emphasis on rotation and bending, global general mobility, some soft tissue work, and a lot of movement variation to kind of get them to move in some different planes and try to get things to kind of release for themselves. Um, on the opposite end for the athletes who are too soft, uh, we're going to look at stiffness and stability, force and impulse management, terminal stability and control, and general strength and motor control. So again, we, we're going to have a lot of overlap, even though, you know, these, these are, you know, theoretically here uh, on opposite ends of the spectrum, there's still going to be a ton of overlap. But this person is going to get more of these qualities in addition to the overlap, whereas this person is going to get more of these qualities. So I kind of already alluded to this a little bit, but, you know, uh, Again, another question that I was just getting a lot when I was having conversations with, with you know, my peer group and, and all these different coaches was, you know, hey, well, where do I fit it? You know, I have, you know, four or five training sessions a week and I have to do this, this and this. And, you know, I only have two assistant coaches. We have 40 athletes in the in the in the gym at one time. Um, you know, how do I fit this in? Um, the way I look at it is is really, well, where is it needed? Um, you know, how much. Uh, are we going to get out of a back squat, RDL, reverse hyper, and, and you know, whatever, split squat, um, for somebody who's already excelling at all of those things, you know? So for somebody like that, I may say they may need a little bit more in their accessory blocks, um, you know, because they've kind of already tapped out their foundational strength. Um, for somebody who can't back squat correctly, 
for somebody who, you know, can't get overhead. Um, you know, they may not need any of the foundational stuff. They may need, uh, you know, a lot of like sling base movement is their primary work. So it just really, really depends. But if we, if we broad stroke this here, um, bear in mind that you're getting an indirect application, uh, on almost all of what you're doing or, or most of what you're doing. So we look at sprinting. That's a quintessential fascial training movement, right? Uh, I, I mean, you're getting an, an enormous amount of fascial training just by doing sprinting, nothing else. No fancy bands, no, no unstable surfaces, nothing. Um, equally with a heavy, you know, three rep back squat, we're getting a lot of, um, you know, fascial work on that. So keep in mind, you're already doing a lot of, you know, what's required for fascial training. Um, but we want to look to take it just a step further. So for me, a lot of my warm up and movement prep is really built around, um, you know, like the spiral chains and, and identifying the, the independent weaknesses of the slings. Um, I think there's a ton of value in intraset work um, with, you know, both for saturating the training session, but also, you know, for throwing in these sling movements. Um, we, that chart back a few slides ago, um, looking at carries and lunges and split squats and chops. Um, your accessory, accessory blocks are a great place to layer your training and, and make them a little bit more fascial or, or sling oriented, um, again, where prudent or needed. And then a big one here that we're going to dive into a little bit is return to play. Um, back to the warm up though. Um, you know, our main criteria for the warm up, we're thinking about tissue glide and hydration, um, collectively those being tissue temperature. Um, the activation and proprioceptive alertness. So, you know, we're thinking like the low intensity skips, multi-directional band walks and tempo lunges. You know, again, notice nothing in here says foam roll, nothing in here says get your, you know, Theragun and get your trigger points. Um, you know, this is basic shit that we're all do, we all do and, and, and think about. Um, you know, sometimes we just have to play a little bit with the, the variables. But the overall goal with the warm-up movement prep is to facilitate the training session. Um, and we want to achieve that by mimicking muscle groups, speeds, and vectors that are going to be experienced in training. For intraset work, um, our overall goal here is to saturate training block um, by implementing non-competing, non-fatiguing movements that are beneficial to the athlete. So we're thinking about isolated and independent strength patterns, tissue potentiation, and terminal stability and motor control. Um, so some good ones here would be, you know, dead bugs and bird dogs, uh, multi-directional plank variations and pulsing type movements <clears throat> for accessory blocks. Um, overall goal, we're trying to saturate the session by progressively and rationally layering foundational training movements to drive individual training adaptations. So this is where, you know, somebody who lacks fundamental strength is going to get a bilateral barbell RDL, um, maybe with an eccentric tempo. Uh, but for somebody who lacks reflexive strength, you know, we may go uh, dumbbell, single leg, single arm RDL with a reflexive impulse at the end range, right? So we're doing the same movement. We're just doing them a little bit differently. Return to play. So uh, this was something that I had a really good conversation with, uh, uh, with uh, one of the coaches, uh, uh, football guy uh, last week. Um, that he was mentioning that he's actually utilizing a lot of sling stuff for his guys coming off of injury. And I was like, oh, shit, brilliant. You know, there it is for the college sector. Um, but if we take, you know, if we think, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, the, the structure or system in the college setting, it's going to be very uh, kind of parted. You know, you're going to have X amount of time with the AT. You're going to have X amount of time with the physician. You're going to have X amount of time with the um, physical therapy staff. And then you're going to get to the strength staff. So, my goal, um, and this is really kind of the premise of my job, is to exploit the shortcomings of conventional rehab and seek to integrate conventional strength applications while accommodating for present def deficiencies. That's not taking a shit on ATs or, or PTs at all. Um, you know, just like us, their time is bound and they have a lot of athletes that they're working with. So a lot of the times, you know, they can only do what they can do. Um, so I think it's our job to try to bridge that gap a little bit better and look to identify some of the, the specific things that are missing from conventional rehab. Um, so I'm looking at restoring and optimizing athlete movement signatures, mitigating those compensatory or faulty patterns, uh, improving force acceptance and movement tolerance, 
and improving force expression and kinetic transfer. So for this, there really are no examples. There, there's a wide range of loading parameters, a wide spectrum of movement combinations. And, you know, I think one thing we can kind of latch onto is some of that rep without rep concept where, <coughs> excuse me, we're just slightly modifying um, the variables or the stimulus uh, in a given set. <coughs> so kind of putting all of that into a hierarchical fashion, um, this is uh, loosely adopted from Alvar Meal, Dan Pfaff, several others. Um, but, you know, when we're looking at the fascial system, we want to think tissue quality and tone first and foremost. Um, if the tissues don't glide or if we don't have that appropriate viscosity or, um, you know, vasomotor tone, then we're not going to be able to do anything that's going to be up the chain. We have to get the tissue quality and tone right first. From there, we want to explore movement capability and capacity. So we're thinking our basic flexibility, mobility, stability principles, um, general glo uh, broad global movements. Um, and then once we're proficient there, then we want to add strength on top of it. Once we're proficient there, then we want to add speed on top of it. So it's very important to understand that each variable is dependent upon its predecessor and we have to be chronological with this. Otherwise, there's going to be some shortcoming. Wanted to throw in a quick little note on stretching here. Um, <clears throat> I know people are, are very opinionated about this. Um, for me personally, uh, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of stretching, like static, end range, long hold. With that being said, um, I think that stretching is fine when we have external load. And the reason I say that is, is I think that when we just get into deep end range static holds, uh, without load, we're, we're giving the body a little bit of a it, kind of an inappropriate signal. Um, you know, we want to bear in mind that this is a proprioceptive endeavor. So uh, basically what gets experienced gets stored. And it's just not a very common thing to have a 30 second touch your toes, you know, so trunk flexion, hamstrings elongated in any sport ever. Um, now I will follow that by saying I have no problem with the placebo effect. If it helps somebody, it helps somebody. Um, you know, if they don't have a specific demand in sport or duty, then whatever. Um, but just my two cents, I, I think that stretching should be very intuitive. It should be very free flowing and loose. Um, you know, and we should try to avoid those, you know, long isometric end range stretches. Um, you know, and, and like we mentioned with Stu McGill, um, you know, if we stretch away our fascial elasticity, all we're left with is muscle. So, um, according to some studies, uh, the, we start to erode elasticity after about a second at end range. So really we want to think, kind of get in, get out. I think generally speaking, dynamic stretching is probably the favorable option for most. Um, static stretching is probably not the best for most. Um, ballistic stretching is likely favorable for those who can, do it correctly, right? You know, we don't want to throw, uh, you know, a 45, 50 year old man or woman who hasn't moved in three years into some, you know, high speed ballistic stretching, obviously. But for those who have reached the point of being able to do it, I think that ballistic stretching is great. Um, so, you know, again, we want to look at the uh, coefficient of restitution or how long something can deform before it's in a, unable to return back to its original shape. All right, so coming down the stretch here, we're going to look at some uh, video analysis and um, kind of look at these in, in groupings or seg sections here. So anterior chain, the basics over here, we're looking at dead bug variations, Turkish get up variations, pal off presses. Um, I just threw in some kind of uh, more advanced movements over here, uh, you know, just kind of for the sake of it. But you know, we want to get proficient on these first. And when we're thinking about anterior sling, the dead bug is the gold standard for anterior sling movements. Um, once we get proficient over here, then we can start to throw these items in. But again, you know, on anterior chain, we're thinking serratus, adductor, a little bit of oblique. And coming back around here, this is actually a, a pretty shitty demonstration on my part. But look at the elbow and the wrist on this inside hand. And notice how I can't fully extend that elbow or that wrist. 
I have no history of injury in the shoulders whatsoever. But I think for me, that anterior chain is just kind of locked up. So that was actually a good example of what you don't want to see. <sighs> Looking now at the posterior chain, um, you know, so you can see tempos are included here, multi-speeds, multi-velocities. <clears throat> but that posterior chain, this is actually a really good one. Lat, glute, lat, glute, um, you know, just kind of keeping everything intact. Again, our basic variations over here, though, we're thinking bird dog, posterior sling holds, which is actually this right here, and glute bridge variations. Um, so for, for those of you wondering, you can never, you, you could have a situation where you never extend beyond a bird dog, that sling hold, and a glute bridge, and you can say that you have su successfully trained the posterior chain. It does not require anything fancy. It does not require anything complex, um, but once we get to these points, if it's capable, then we get into stuff like this. Lateral chain, uh, for here, looking at the resistant strength, so offset, barbell step up, obviously the goal here is to keep the torso vertical, keep the pillar upright, so we're working on uh, resisting lateral bending. Uh, this is a cool one here, you know, starting high, sticking at the midline. Uh, resisting that rotational force and Tim has given me a little bit of a um, an overspeed effect there and then you know a dynamic pal off press is another good one um, where we're obviously resisting that rotational force there but your basics side plank variations band anti movements and you know jammer med ball throws um, the whole goal again just being uh, resisting lateral forces Now we come into uh, our lateral chain expressive, your basics, chop variations, med ball variations, lateral bounds. Um, you know, again, in the video here for some of the more advanced ones, uh, Tim's giving me a hand here for some overspeed pal offs. Um, here we're looking at eccentric overload on a rope chop. And, you know, something like this is great, I think, uh, in lieu of like a cable or a band because every rep is a little bit different. I can't anticipate right there on cue. I can't anticipate what that, that tension is going to be on the rope. So I think it just gives a more natural effect. Um, you know, here adding a little bit of a ballistic or a dynamic nature into the chop. Uh, again, you know, just that reflexive strength. And right on cue, uh, you know, looking at this, these reflexive properties, our basics are going to be jump rope, you know, any kind of bounding, hopping, skipping, jumping, Anything that has a myotatic type stimulus, so this is actually a good example for that myotatic type stimulus. We have an oscillation or a perturbation here with the kettlebell, and we're going into a linear or a lateral bound. Here, looking at RFD or, or amortization, the ability to load, absorb, and then express. Um, this is a great one for posterior leg chain, calf, Achilles, ankle complex, um, taking that to a single leg. Uh, these are pretty pretty advanced, but I mean again, you know, you just do it into a regular depth jump or a, a counter movement jump and we're getting the, the same type of training effect. Perturbation oscillation. Um, I'm just a huge fan of these. I just think that it has a lot of a lot about a lot of value. Um, I think that there's a lot to this, but you know, uh, carries inertia wave, battle ropes, any kind of impulse or med ball type throw. All of those, you know, check the box perfectly fine. We can we can take it and advance, you know, something like a front rack carry to something like this that just gives that additional uh, perturbation stimulus. Um, but, you know, again, just looking at how we can challenge locomotion from a neural perspective. And the way that I look at the nervous system is, is like a river. We have the width of the river, which is our ability to tolerate variability, the depth of the river, which is the ability to tolerate fatigue or fatigue resistance, and then we have the current or the speed of the river, which is our speed of, of transmission or contraction. And lastly here, with a, a great cameo from my man Vern, um, looking at offset and uneven, unbalanced methods. So. Always start with dumbbells or kettlebells, give you know the athletes independent control of each, then we bring it to a barbell, 
and then we add offset plus accommodating resistance um, as a third step or a tertiary step there. Um, so this is a, a common one for me, band offset push-ups. Those are great for that anterior and posterior chain. Um, but we're just building density here. So, you know, for, for those who have uh, limited time, limited resource, you know, instead of just programming an overhead press for your second or third block, you know, we can start to add in just offset overhead press, um, take the emphasis off of the amount of weight on the bar, put the emphasis on being able to maintain good position and good control. Coming down the stretch here, <clears throat> primary takeaway points. Fascia is an extracellular collagenous matrix. It envelops every muscle, muscle fiber, and soft tissue cell structure in the body, and it is a non-Newtonian fluid that has a non-linear or origin. So everything is omnidirectional. Um, we're thinking about helping uh, posture, supporting structure, uh, producing movement, managing external internal forces and that proprioceptive element of kinesthetic awareness. Four main properties, plasticity, elasticity, viscosity and remodeling. In training, multiplanar, multidirectional, challenge both common and uncommon vectors. Um, and again, you know, looking at the unique movements in, in the sports that you work with, uh, we want a high spectrum of speeds, emphasis on higher velocity, um, to suit the neural properties and the mechanical properties, slower, longer movements to suit the plastic and viscous properties. Um, you know, also using a wide uh, spectrum of loading, uh, you know, because we, like we've said, different responses um, for each. That re return to play factor, um, you know, it, it should speak for itself at this point that FASH is a major variable in, in injury manifestation and repair. Um, so, you know, we want to give it credence for trying to get guys, girls back on the field. Um, athletes should be observed from, uh, you know, multiple biological systems, right? It's not just muscles. It's not just muscles and tendons. Um, it's not just cardiovascular. All of these different things, similar to energy systems, are all at play at once. It's just a matter of what's being emphasized. Um, and ultimately, we just want to build resiliency and robustness. Um, with the constructs of, of reducing rate of re-injury or performance deg degradation. Those big four again, I won't go line by line on these, but you know, this is a good takeaway piece here. Um, just kind of hitting those touch points on all of our different uh, properties. And finally here, uh, touching back on, you know, progressing our movements, it's very important you know, that we're adept here before we consider anything on the right side of this screen. Um, we got to be, you know, proficient with our, our, our fun foundational movements and our fundamental patterns um, before we try to add anything to it. But once we're good here, apply specific tempos, <clears throat> increase the ranges of motion, add velocities, introduce positional strengths. Um, those are going to be, you know, specific to the athlete, what they show is weak or deficient. Then we're going to change external stimulus, start to blend those cardinal planes. And our last layer here, our myotatic stimulus um, or reflexive properties, introducing our offset and unbalanced loading. I think the important part here, you know, again, I can't, I can't overstate it enough is, you know, you're not creating variation or, or variability just for the sake of doing so there's intent behind everything and uh, you know honestly I'm surprised I don't get a little bit more shit on uh, some of the things that I post but you know everything that I'm posting is not gimmicky and and you know for for likes or for cloud or whatever um, you know these are things that I'm really doing in application these are things I'm really working with my athletes and these are things that you know anecdotally I've, I've really seen you know some incredible results with so um, just make sure you know that you're, you're doing things for a purpose and not just for the sake of doing so. But with all that being said, that is all I got for you. I can't believe that I did that in an hour and 10 minutes. But, um, you know, like I mentioned, I'm probably going to break these up into a couple of different pieces. So, um, you know, please, please be sure to, to uh, watch all the way through. Um, and, you know, if you have any questions on any of this stuff, always feel free to hit me up. Um, I know this was a lot of material in a short amount of time, but uh, hopefully I got my points across and hopefully you were able to take something away from this. 
Um, and you know, with everything still going on in the world, I hope that everybody is uh, doing well and, and staying safe and making the most of their time.